Uh, so yeah, so thank you, uh, Dr. Park and Dr. Hofstetter for uh, giving me this opportunity to give this talk. Thank you to the Seattle Science Foundation. Um, and thank you to Dr. Hofstetter for giving me the opportunity to really learn in five, six months what he has learned in seven, eight years. So I'm super excited to be starting this back, uh, back home in Michigan and hope I can be as good as he is one day for sure. Um, so I wanted to talk about the case presentation. So, um, and I'm gonna try not to be redundant, especially that you know, Dr. Hofstetter will be doing a demo, which I think uh, everything will make more sense once you see it um, in the cadaver. So we had a patient of ours earlier this year, 57-year-old male, had a history of a left L4, L5 hemilaminectomy in 2019, who presented with one year of worsening lower back pain uh, with right greater than left leg pain. Um, he had a me mechanical component uh, to his pain, and his back pain was worse than the leg pain. Um, no pertinent history other than that. On examination, it was pretty much full strength with the exception of some slight weakness that maybe was pain limited in his right gluteus medius. So this is a patient who used to have left leg pain, had this hemilaminectomy done, got better, and then started having back pain with right leg pain, um, and, and that's why he presented to us. So um, in, in terms of his imaging, uh, this is what he has. So what you see here on the left is, uh, there's uh, this is a T1 parasagittal showing foraminal stenosis um, on the right side, so right-sided parasagittal cut, showing foraminal stenosis at 4-5 with some mass effect on the root. In the middle, you see a midline cut um, showing on the right side, lateral recess stenosis on the right side, um, likely scar tissue on the left side causing some lateral recess stenosis, but the central canal is open. So we have bilateral lateral recess stenosis, right-sided greater than left-sided foraminal stenosis in a patient with mostly back pain and, um, um, and right, greater than leg pain, right greater than left leg pain. Uh, in terms of his uh, dynamic imaging, there is no instability seen here. So we ask ourselves, what's the first thing to do for this patient? So obviously the first thing we do is a conservative measure. So he was sent for uh, medial branch blocks, which he had two of them done with a significant reduction in his back pain. Um, but it just came back after a few months. He had a radiofrequency ablation, which also helped, but then you know he had recurrence of symptoms and he had more leg pain now than he did prior. So he came back with these symptoms, and at this point, uh, he was ready for surgical intervention. And in this situation, you have multiple different treatment options that you can uh, go through. So the first one is, you know, could you do a redo full laminectomy? The thing that goes against that is, you know, we did a L4 nerve block on the right side to determine how symptomatic he was from the foraminal stenosis, and he got significant relief from the block, so which meant that he was probably symptomatic from the foraminal stenosis, and he had a big aspect of mechanical back pain. Um, in addition, you'd have to go through the scar tissue on that left side, so there's a risk of getting a, uh, you know, a durotomy. Um, so that's the first uh, option. The second option is relying on indirect decompression. Um, in this situation, the disc space is pretty plump, so you'd have to put in a very large cage to get enough indirect decompression. Um, and he also, you know, the, and when you, if you're thinking about doing that, which is a very reasonable plan, you want to look at the iliac crest, like uh, the speakers talked about earlier, and the psoas anatomy to determine whether you'd go trans psoas or pre psoas. So very reasonable approach. Uh, but in this situation, because of the plump disc space probably would not be as successful as if it was a collapsed disc space in getting the foraminal uh, decompression. Um, next is doing an open t lift, which again is a very reasonable option, but you'd have to deal with the scar tissue on that left side. Uh, and then lastly, which is what we did, uh, is a minimally invasive t lift, whether endoscopic or uh, utilizing a, you know, conventional microscopic uh, techniques, where you get a direct decompression on the side of the more uh, problematic symptoms, and you get indirect decompression on the contralateral side. Um, and in our situation, or in our, in Dr. Hofstadter's practice, if you have no central stenosis and you have lateral recess stenosis and foraminal stenosis, you get an uh, endoscopic T lift, and that's what we did. So, uh, like Dr. Hofstadter talked about earlier, not all endoscopic T lifts are the same. So, initially, endoscopic T lifts were done through this transcambin triangle where the cages were put in from super lateral. And this is, you see, one of Dr. Hofstadter's cases where the cage is all the way over to the other side, um, not really in the midline. Um, then you have this, you know, the, the um, the optimesh uh, or the bone uh, cage, which relies on indirect decompression on both sides. But lastly, and what we did in this case, uh, is a more uh, 
conventional telif, where you come in from a lateral approach, you do the foraminotomy, you do the facet resection, but then when you want to put in your cage, you go from a more, more medial approach, and Dr. Hofstetter will show that in the uh, lab. Um, and what this allows you to do is to get a cage in a more conventional position uh, in the midline, and also gives you the ability to, ex if you're using an expandable cage to get the maximum lordosis, and you're able to put in a much bigger cage as well, because Camden's triangle, when you're coming from a more dorsal approach, is more amenable for a wider cage. So you're able to put in a bigger cage if you're able to come in from what's called the posterolateral approach. So Dr. Hofstetter talked about what the uh, the benefits of this procedure are. So in this specific situation, there's really no nerve root uh, retraction at all, um, which is different than from do when we do this uh, with a microscope. There's a decreased derotomy rate because everything is done under water pressure, and the water pressure really just pushes everything away. It's actually really hard to get a derotomy. As much as I've tried to get him a derotomy, I, it's, I've been unsuccessful in doing that. Um, it's just really, really hard to get a derotomy. Uh, the visualization is closer to the nerve roots as well, so you're really able to have very intricate uh, bites there. And again, because you're not retracting anything, um, it's harder to get a derotomy. Uh, and in the hands of someone who's experienced, it's similar operating time. Uh, Dr. Hofstetter will go over the steps of the operation, so I won't belabor that. But this is uh, an intraoperative CT scan showing the extent of the facet resection. So we did a right-sided telip here. So you see the facet is completely gone. And this is all done from this you know, very lateral approach where you're using the reamers that he showed earlier. So you really goes in from a lateral, um, uh, lateral approach, docks that jam sheety into the SAP, and then uses a bunch of reamers to really pretty much take out the whole thing, finish up the this facetectomy with a drill, and then he goes from a more medial approach, which is where your incisions are for the pedicle screws to actually put in the cage to have the cage be in a more central location in, in a more conventional way. Um, and this is, these are our final intraoperative uh, images. Um, so this is what this patient uh, went through. He was discharged on post-op day one, stable neurologic exam. At the two-week visit, his back pain was much better. Right leg pain was much better. He still had his left leg pain, uh, but it was decreased from his uh, preoperative baseline, and he has his three-month follow-up scheduled with us in, in two weeks or so. So thank you all very much. Uh, first Salma, uh, we have a question from uh, Laura uh, Snyder, and her, her question is, what do you think is the best way to learn this technique? Can you tell us a little bit about the learning curve and your recommendations about starting to learn how to do this procedure? Absolutely, and I think that's a great question, and there's so many ways of doing this. So when I started wanting to learn this, it was right after um, my first fellowship, and I went to South Korea to, to learn this, and it was great, but it was only six weeks, um, and it was more of an observership, so I just didn't think that I got uh, the best. I, I felt like I knew everything here, but in terms of my hand skills, I wasn't there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, hear, I thought I was hearing Hofstetter's voice in my head, but I think it's, it's real. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and I think you know, uh, working with the industry for cadaver courses is, I think, the most realistic way of learning this. Um, but honestly, the best thing is what I did. I took a six-month sabbatical and came and worked with Hofstetter. Um, because then day in and day out, you're living and you're breathing this. Um, so that's the best way, but again, that's not really uh, realistic for most of us. I was very lucky that I was able to do that. So I think to the uh, limits of what most of us can do, probably working with industry on uh, cadaver courses and really starting from more straightforward procedures and slowly, uh, as you're gaining more experience and confidence, going to these higher level cases like the T-lifts and doing you know, these uh, thoracic discs, that's probably the most realistic way of doing it. Great, Osama. You know, um, can you speak to like, you know, I, I, when looking at that CT of that modification of, of the endo T lift, honestly, it was a complete facetectomy, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I, it, to me, um, I, I thought one of the benefits of an endo T lift was you're preserving a lot more of the bony structure, mm -hmm. but in a sense, you're, you're kind of coming along the lines of more of an MIS, mm -hmm. tubular T lift type of picture. Uh, I guess one, like you're using Reamer, so is, it, is there a time sink doing it or is it pretty straightforward? And I, it's interesting, if you're that lateral, I don't know how you could still angle it to, to, to get the cage in the midline. It seems like it, 
you know, I'm trying to picture that. It seems like it'd be a little bit of a stretch. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, that's a, those are great questions. So in terms of the amount of bony resection, the nice thing about endoscopy is that you can uh, individualize it. So for this patient, we thought he needed a full facetectomy to get that lateral recess decompressed directly. So that's why that's what he got. But going back to what I was uh, showing earlier, you know, there's two approaches to put in the cage. So pretty much you start lateral, you, you use the reamers, which the reamers are way faster than drilling, at least endoscopically, because the endoscopic drills are not sharp. They're uh, coarse, um, so it takes forever to drill. Um, and if reamers, do a lot of bone work much faster. Not as fast as if you're doing using like the M8 or something, obviously. But if, when you compare the endoscopic drills to the reamers, the reamers does a lot more damage on the bone without uh, in less time. So that's the reason why we start lateral. You ream as much bone as you think is necessary for that patient. And this patient, we thought, needed a complete facetectomy. Uh, but then in terms of putting in the cage, um, for this patient, because we want the cage to be more midline, you actually use the incision, that, the, the, the pedicle screw incision. All of so you really end up with two uh, incisions for the pedicle screws, like you would for a regular MIS t and then you have one itty-bitty, like less than a centimeter incision lateral, which is the one that you do the facetectomy with. I see, so you're putting the cage through the... Screw it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. exactly. Well, that wasn't clear cut to me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. And yeah, and then there, the thing is, is I know Dr. Hofser will show it. So there's a, a different cannula that you put into the disc, and that's why you don't have to retract at all. Okay. Uh, because you have a cannula that all the neural elements are around it, and you put it down under direct visualization. So then you're able to put in a regular size cage in the regular trajectory that you usually do. Okay. That's great. Uh, so that's like modification, uh, or his modification? His modification, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. What's the incidence of use of endoscopic in the U.S. compared to Asia? I, I was over here years ago. Everybody was doing endoscopic. It was like, well, don't chew. <laughs> like, what, what's our incidence here, and what's the future for it? No, I think that's a great question. I'll leave that to Dr. Hofstetter to answer. But yeah, in Asia, uh, when I was in Korea, it was everybody was doing it. It wasn't like there was endoscopic surgeons and non-endoscopic surgeons. Everyone was doing it. It just depended on how comfortable way they were. Uh, but they were, that was back in 2018, so I'm sure it has uh, gotten even more and more uh, prevalent there. Um, in terms of here, I think uh, the, the issue is, you know, we already thankfully most, mostly get good outcomes doing spine surgery. Doing this with a tube or doing it open, we get good outcomes. So if you're in practice, uh, there's, it's hard to be like, oh, I'm going to learn this thing when you know it's going to take so much to get to the point of where, you know, Hofstetter is. So I think that's the thing that's going to, I guess, hold that technology back here. Um, but I think as we have more of us that are learning it, um, especially, you know, if you're training fellows or residents, and I think that's when things will take off here.